because of a comment you made and because of the lack of understanding, a sheikh from UK has said that you have committed kufr and he asked you to make tawbah. You mentioned in a lecture a few days ago that some critics called you, also called you a kafir. This is not the first time as Islamic scholar has been called a kafir. I think in the past, um, Dr. Isa Ahmad, Rahimahullah, Dr. Zayed Naik, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, Numan Ali Khan and others have been also called kafirs. I've also heard Mawlana's from different sects of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Malaysia and other parts of the world calling each other kafir. So my question is, is it permissible to call an Islamic scholar a kafir just because we don't understand him or we're doubtful about his aqidah? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When someone uh, makes a statement or commits an act which is very clearly an act of kufr, then it is an obligation of his peers, the scholars of Islam, to respond and point out that this is an act of kufr and you are indeed a kafir. But there's a process. The process is that you have to make, write out a fatwa of kufr. And in that fatwa you have to put your name and you have to argue the case why this person is a kafir, what has he done to commit an act of kufr. You can't simply say this fellow is kafir. That's a schoolboy way, but the scholar would not do that. The scholar will prepare a fatwa and which he will declare, this is the reason why I have declared that so-and-so is a kafir. And this is very important, a very important institution in Islam to protect the purity of the faith. In the case of, a, of a, a, my own case, um, I have to spend, take some time with, with you Dean on this occasion uh, and to speak clearly and to repeat myself so that it may sink in that you're making a mistake. Uh, I have never ever declared that there is a mistake in the Quran. Let me repeat that. I have never ever declared that there is a mistake in the Quran. Whoever makes such a statement is definitely acting in a manner which is kufr to say that there is a mistake in the Quran when Allah himself says that he is protecting this Quran. No one can change this Quran. No one can corrupt this Quran. Never until Qiyamah this Quran is protected. So then why are they making this mistake? Why are they declaring of me that I have declared that there is a mistake in the Quran when I have never ever said such a thing. The answer is they have come to the conclusion and they will have to answer on Judgment Day for this wrong and sinful conclusion. They have come to the conclusion that the Tashkil, um, that is the Fatha and Kesra and Dhamma and so on, which perhaps may be part of punctuation. If you would allow me to use the word punctuation, if you will allow me to use the word punctuation to help people to understand that the tashkil in the Quran, they are a part of the Quran. They are a part of the Quran which was revealed by Allah. And they are a part of the Quran protected by Allah. This is false. This is not only false, this is sinful. Because the Tashkil were not a part of the Quran when the Quran was revealed. Number one, the Quran did not have Tashkil during the times of the companions of the Prophet. Tashkil were added at a later time and were added by human beings, not by angels. Human beings put in the Tashkil to help the non-Arab, like Imran Hussein, to be able to recite the Quran. The Arabs did not need the Tashkil. If you look at Urdu language now, the newspapers, you never find any Tashkil in the Urdu because they don't need it. But the non-Urdu speaking, the non-Arabic speaking people, they need the Tashkil in order to recite the Quran. 
So the Tashkil were added later on, much later on. And therefore they were done by human being. And therefore this is not a part of the Quran. But what can I do? What can I do when people insist now in defiance of all knowledge on the subject that the Tashkil are a part of the Quran? My warning to them is that you will have to answer on Judgment Day for adding to the Quran what was not a part of the Quran. If you add something to the Quran and you say this is a part of the Quran, that is a monstrously dangerous sin. I, will, I can only ask that Allah may forgive them because they don't have the knowledge. They don't have the knowledge and they're running away with ignorance and concluding that the Tashkil are a part of the Quran when they are not. This is my first response. I have said that a verse of the Quran in Surah to Zuhraf, is, it is, it, they are telling me it can be read two ways and both of them are equally valid. One of them says that surely he, the pronoun here, based on the context, is certainly without, debt, without any doubt referring to Nabi Isa alayhi salam, Jesus. That surely Jesus, Nabi Isa alayhi salam, surely he is a sign of the last hour. That is one reading. And this is the recitation of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma who is one of the foremost companions of the Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, in respect of the knowledge of the Quran and the explanation of the Quran. Abdullah ibn Abbas stands high, shoulders, heads and shoulders above all the others. He has the highest rank. And this is how he recited the Quran. Let me repeat this for those who are hard of hearing. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he recited the Quran this way, وَإِنَّهُ لَعَلَمٌ لِسَعْنُ that he, Jesus, is the sign of the last hour, or is it a sign of the last hour. Good. My question is, and I ask my critics to kindly calm down, and think and then offer a scholarly response. If this is the way that the, one of the foremost companions of the Prophet recited the Quran, how do we explain that you cannot find any copy of the Quran today? I have never found any. I don't know if there are any. You cannot find any copy of the Quran today with the Tashkil which conformed with his recitation of the Quran. I want an answer to that question. I want you to tell me why. Why is it that the Tashkil of Abdullah ibn Abbas has now disappeared completely and totally? And no copy of the Quran today reflects that recitation of Abdullah ibn Abbas. This seems to me something mysterious. This seems to me something that crying out for an explanation. There's something wrong here. If there were some copies of the Quran this way and some that way, that could, could be understood. But why is it that no copy of the Quran anywhere in the world today that I am aware of is with the Tashkil of Abdullah ibn Abbas? That's the first question I ask. And I am waiting on a response from those who have a capacity to think and to understand and give me an answer to that question. The second problem is Allah says in the Quran that the Quran is comprised of only two kinds of verses, only two, not three, only two. First are those which are ayat muhkamat, 
And these are verses which are plain and clear. You do not have to interpret. You do not have to say that when Allah said so and so, what he meant is so and so. That would be an ayah mutishabiha. An ayah muhkama is plain and clear and does not require any interpretation. All that it requires is explanation. And Allah says about ayat muhkama that these are ummul kitab. This is the very heart and substance of the Quran. So you have to be reckless, reckless to take an ayah muhkama and transform it into an ayah mutashabiha. This is recklessness because this is the heart of the Quran. And who are those who can recognize an ayah mutashabiha? The Quran speaks of those who are rasikuna fil in, those who are firmly grounded in knowledge. They are the ones who can un recognize an ayah mutashabiha and who can interpret it. An ayah mutashabiha is a verse which has to be interpreted in order to be understood. Like, for example, eat and drink until the white thread of dawn is distinct from the black thread. Then you'll begin the fast. It remained for our Prophet to explain to one of his companions who came to him, said, I, I, I took out the white thread, I took out the black thread, but I have difficulty. Only then did the Prophet give the ta'wil that this verse of Surah Al-Baqarah is an ayah mutashabiha. What Allah meant by it was eat and drink until the light of the day is distinct from the darkness of the night. This is why I never perform Salatul Fajr deen until I can see that the light of the day is distinct from me from the darkness of the night. Only then do I perform Salatul Fajr. They can do what they want with the azan, but this is where I perform my salat because the light of the day must be distinct from the darkness of the night. Here is the classical example of an ayah mutashabiha. Now then, so the first reading of the verse in Surah Al-Zukhruf is وَإِنَّهُ لَعَلَمٌ لِسَعْ And he, Jesus, he is the knowledge or he is a knowledge of the last hour. What does it mean? The explanation, not interpretation. The explanation is nothing in his life, Nabi Isa, nothing in his life, not even his virgin birth, can qualify as a sign of the last hour when the last prophet is still to come. He is to come 600 years later. The last kitab, the Quran, is still to be revealed. It will be revealed 600 years later. So how can something in the life of Nabi Isa Islam, including his virgin birth, how can it qualify as a sign of the last hour? My explanation is the only way that he can qualify as a sign of the last hour is when he returns. It is the return of Nabi Isa Islam which qualifies as a sign of the last hour. And I am making this effort. I'm doing everything I can possibly do to explain this verse of the Quran. Not for those who are calling me Kafir, may Allah forgive them, but for those eminent scholars of the Quran, Dean, eminent scholars of Islam, who reject belief in the return of Jesus. There have been two, Sheikh Al Azhar, the head of Al Azhar University, two of them who rejected the belief. One of them was Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, and the other was Sheikh Mahmoud Shaltut. In fact, Sheikh Mahmoud Shaltut even wrote out a fatwa, and the fatwa is bogus, it's wrong. But they were convinced that the Quran does not establish the return 
of Jesus, Nabi Isa Islam. That's how they came to this conclusion. But there's more in the Quran. I don't have the time to deal with it. But one of the reasons why these people, and some of them are still alive today, I don't want to mention their name, but they're eminent scholars. They're more learned than I am. I've rejected belief in the return of Jesus. One of the reasons is because of this verse of Surah to Zuhra. This is an ayah muhkama. This is the heart of the Quran, that he, Jesus, is the sign of the last hour. The context in which the verse is revealed points plainly and clearly to Jesus, that he is the sign of the law. So when Muhammad Asad, in order to get out of this quick, this um, difficulty in which he found himself, because Muhammad Asad, may Allah forgive him, he, he rejected belief in the return of Jesus. So he said that when the pronoun was used for innahu, surely it, meaning the Quran. No, Muhammad Asad, you made a mistake. And may Allah forgive you. The context in which this verse is revealed is Jesus, not the Quran, Jesus, okay? So now then, if they had recognized this, Ayah Muhkama, if they had recognized it to be saying that surely he, Jesus, is the sign of the last hour, then using my argument that nothing in the life of Jesus, nothing in his, not even his virgin birth, can qualify as a sign of the last hour when the last prophet has not as yet come and the last kitab script of the Quran has not as yet been revealed. These scholars of Islam would now be persuaded that yes, he is a sign of the last hour in the sense that his return to this world is the sign par excellence of the last hour. And so this is the struggle I'm waging, Dean, not with the schoolboys who are declaring me to be a Catholic, may Allah forgive them, but I'm waging this struggle to get that world of a scholarship to return to the belief that Jesus, Nabi Isa, Isa will one day return. I'm doing this also because I am certain that in this age of the internet and in this age of monstrous brainwashing taking place. Everybody is there with their smartphone and they are lapping, they are lapping in all the brainwashing that is being done. The, the jar is brainwashing mankind. So Dean, I'm warning, I won't be in the world tomorrow, but there is a tomorrow which is coming. Remember what I'm saying. When large numbers of Muslims are going to reject belief in the return of Jesus. When that day comes, this is one of the reasons why they will reject belief. Because you are insisting that the correct recitation of the Quran is the one which is to be found in every kitab which is written today with the Tashki, which says, وَإِنَّهُ لَعِلْمُ الْلِسَعَةِ Every single copy of the Quran says that today, every single one. And so can you blame them when they say, how can he be the knowledge of the hour? This is what the verse says. Ilm means knowledge. That's what the word is used in the Quran for. So how can Jesus, Nabi Isa, Isa how can he be the ilm of the sa'a if the ilm of the sa'a is not with him? Let me repeat that. How is it possible for him to be the ilm of the sa'a if the ilm of the sa'a is not with him? Let me repeat it one more time, Dean. How is it possible? This is elementary logic. How is it possible for him to be the ilm of the sa'a if the ilm of the sa'a is not with him? But Allah has said again and again in the Quran 
that the ilm of the sar is only with Allah. Only with Allah. So it cannot be with him. So this is an ayah muhkama. وَإِنَّهُ لَعِلْمُ الْلِسَارِ This is an ayah muhkama. It does not require any interpretation. Not at all. This is umul kitab if this is the correct skill. This is umul kitab. So therefore, there is a conflict, a contradiction in the Quran between this verse, وَإِنَّهُ لَعِلْمُ الْلِسَارِ and the rest of the Quran. And my critics recognize that there is a conflict here. So what do they do? <laughs> and this, uh, Dean, this is reckless conduct. This is really reckless conduct. To take an ayah muhkama and now transform it into an ayah mutashabiha. Remember, when you make an ayah mutashabiha and you interpret it, remember, no one can confirm your interpretation to be correct. Only Allah can confirm it. Only Allah can confirm it. So when you say, when Allah says that he is the ilm of the sa'ah, what Allah meant by that is this. You are making a ta'weed, you are interpreting the verse. If you say that when Allah said, he is the knowledge of the hour, what Allah meant by that is this or that or the other. What you have done is you have taken an ayah muhkama and you have transformed it into an ayah mutashabiha and that is a PhD in recklessness. You will have to answer for that on Judgment Day. If you, if you take this and make it an ayah mutashabiha, good. And now you have an ayah muhkama, which says, he is the sign of the last hour. Which one will prevail? Which one will prevail? An ayah muhkama or your bogus ayah mutashabiha? Where you've taken an ayah muhkama and transformed it into an ayah mutashabiha. And so I rest my case. I am confident, Dean, I'm confident that I am correct on this issue. And on Judgment Day, I wait. I wait on Judgment Day, and they will also wait. But their scholar this scholarship is pathetic, that you try to argue and argue and argue that the Cheshkil is a part of the Quran. You argue and argue and argue that you can take an ayah muhkama and then interpret it and make it an ayah mutashabiha. I'm warning them. This is not proper scholarship. The way to recite the Quran, Imran Hussein is saying this, and his students have the amount of intelligence and common sense to understand what I'm saying, that this is the correct way to recite the Quran. The way that Abdullah ibn Abbas recited it, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, wa innahu la'alamun lissar, and I, I ask the question, and I ask it of my critics, and I ask it of all Muslims. If this is the way that Abdullah ibn Abbas recited the Quran, how do you explain that every single copy of the Quran today has it a scale different from that of Abdullah ibn Abbas? Thank you.